from me, Zima Sivadin, as the chair of Commonwealth Future. It's great to see such a distinctive group of people spanning so many parts of the world at this virtual meeting. We have some housekeeping rules for this webinar. There will be time for questions and answers following each speaker's presentation. Please keep your microphone muted during the webinar. We are recording this session. Thank you. A quick introduction to the Commonwealth future and the Commonwealth before we introduce our distinguished guests, speakers. Our Commonwealth represents one of the largest groupings of countries outside the United Nations with almost a third of the world's population joined by the shared values of free and democratic societies, the promotion of peace and prosperity to improve the lives for all the people of other Commonwealth. Commonwealth Future is a new civil society organization dedicated to alleviating deficiencies in human vision through eye care and correctable aids throughout the Commonwealth. It promotes quality education as a foundation for betterment of lives through our series, I Care Education Through Reading. A recent report by the World Health Organization found that more than two billion individuals around the world had eye issues or blindness that were either preventable or curable. It is estimated that 900 million people or close to half of the global persons with visual impairment are in the Commonwealth. Never before have we had a serious wake-up call that our health is everything. We have embraced well-being like never before. We are taking more notice of our sensory health. In fact, we are already seeing it. Improving eye care and extending vision correction would improve lives directly and through access to education and knowledge. Awareness and education, in particular character education, is what brings us here together today. Our eyes show character and our true feelings. Our eyes never lie. A genuine smile shines through in our eyes with age. They will still twink twinkle. Two of our speakers today, Sir Anthony Selden and Professor James Arthur OBE, are co-authors of a recently published book on this subject called Educating for Characterful Society, which focuses on the role of education to develop commitment to the virtues of truth, justice, honesty, trust, and a sense of duty. Aspects of character which are critical importance for fair, just, and democratic societies. Our third speaker, Mr. Timothy Metcalf, will address the powerful potential that artificial intelligence, AI, offers to enhance the quality of education and its global reach. We've just been privileged to have Sir Anthony Selden uh, join us. Sir. He's such a busy man. Um, I'm just wondering whether Sir Anthony um, is um, available um, to um, uh, come and speak. I'm just going to introduce um, Sir Anthony uh, Selden. Sir Anthony Selden, Vice Chancellor of the University of Buckingham, is one of Britain's leading contemporary historians, educationalists, commentators, and political authors. He has authored more than 40 books on contemporary history, including biographies of a number of recent prime ministers. So Anthony has a diverse portfolio of roles. He's a director of the Royal Shakespeare Company, chair of the National Archives Trust, and is patron of several charities. We are privileged to have Sir Anthony Selden address the challenge of educating for society of characterful society, the responsibility and the public good. 
Thank you, um, Santony. Well, it's a great pleasure. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yes, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for inviting me. And can you just remind me how long you would like me to speak for? Um, we'd be uh, delighted if we could speak for 15 minutes, um, if, um, if it's possible. Uh, we've read your book and it's, uh, um, there's so much um, you've encompassed in it. It'd be lovely uh, to hear and then we can perhaps follow up uh, with a five minutes of question and answer session with you before you leave, uh, Santony. I would um, always like to begin uh, with a question to those people I'm talking to, because a, a proper communication doesn't involve um, somebody at the front just, just speaking. So I'd just like everybody just to pause for a moment and reflect upon your own uh, evolution of good character and to ask yourselves what were the influences in your lives that led to the formation of the good character and can of course have a, a bad character what is beyond doubt though is that we can't live without a character we can have uh, good and and bad characters but with the good virtues by which i would mean um endeavor uh, honesty, uh, truthfulness, uh, consideration and kindness, uh, commitment to complete a task. There are many others, but uh, I'd start with just those five. And I'd just like everyone to spend a minute just reflecting on to the extent that you think you are the possessors or the holders of those virtues or exemplifiers of them, where did they come from? Were they innate inside you or were they induced or encouraged by, by who? Uh, so just spend a moment if you would just thinking that through. Thirty seconds more. So, bringing that to some kind of uh, conclusion, I think it's a very important question to ask in discussions about character, uh, in discussions about uh, what constitutes uh, morality in education or the development of well-being in education, um, we can too often be passive recipients, listening to others, judging what they're saying without reflecting upon ourselves and our own experience and how that uh, affects our uh, children, if we have children, um, and how it affects the way that we are in society. So uh, that would be uh, very much uh, at the heart of what I'm saying, and that education has been allowed in this century in particular to become the world over uh, very much identified with the passing of tests and exams. So we use that word good and we say this is a good school system or this is a good um, school system nationally uh, or this is a good individual school or this is a good 
head or principal, or this is a good teacher, or this is a good student. Uh, and we use these words liberally all the time. You hear them uh, used in public discourse by governments, by officials in the media. And what is meant is nothing to do with uh, moral goodness, but the ability of that uh, school system nationally or locally or the individual school or the individual head or the individual teacher or the individual student to be successful at passing exams. Don't get me wrong. Exams are important. Exams are and tests are very important. Exams and tests, though, are not all important. And by allowing them to become all important, partly because they are measurable and comparable between different uh, schools within a nation, within a region, and between different regions and different uh, countries, because we can do that and have international, internationally comparable tests and exams, then we have allowed them to become all important. And what we measure is what we give our resources and time to. So if you measure something, um, and there are very good reasons for measuring it, not the least cost effectiveness, um, but if you allow that measure to become all important, and if you identify that measure as all important, then it will become all important, um, then other things get squeezed out. And I would suggest that character is as important as uh, exams. I would go further. I would say good character is more important than good exam results. Now, in England, we have um, a school system which, at least before COVID struck, was widely admired for being uh, in many ways an excellent uh, system uh, and very much evidence-based. And part of the reason why the advocates of this exam and test and uh, accountability regimes monitored by um, the inspection service, part of the reason why people who are fully paid up members of that um, believe uh, why they are dismissive of character is because it cannot be measured. Um, you can measure what a good student is in terms of what they get in mass literacy and science, but you can't in terms of uh, kindness, um, honesty, um, and integrity. Um, you can't, and you can't rate the students from one to 250. You can't rate uh, and compare the schools or the regions or the nations in the same way that you can with literacy uh, and maths um, and science. So um, this other side, which I would say is at least 50% of the importance, has got squeezed. And um, yet I have never in my life, anywhere in the world, met someone who I would intuitively describe as a good teacher at uh, college or university or school who doesn't have a commitment to the development of the all-round, including character development of the uh, young person alongside um, their cognitive development. And um, in, in, in England, we have a system, uh, this wonderfully empirically underpinned system, which sees um, over a third of trainee teachers quit within four or five years, uh, quitting often um, because they feel degraded and, and demoralized by this um, exam rich system. And um, we're losing some of the very best and the most sensitive. And we're having a system that fails a third of our young people who don't pass their tests and exams at the requisite standard in English and maths. And then a third who go up to university, which is roughly half the population, 
are, are reporting some form of mental health condition. So we have a third of teachers dropping out, a third of being failed by the system, and a third going on with a, a mental health problem. And yet we say we have a marvellous system. And I think that if we had character much more ingrained uh, in our school system, and AI um, will allow us, artificial intelligence will allow us um, to do that in ways that we'll hear about, uh, I think we'd have a better system. And exams and tests would not decline as a result of that. Exams and test results would improve because if you have young people who are nurtured in the virtue of hard work and honesty and completing uh, their task, um, you would find that, 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 that these are um, uh, work-based uh, performance virtues that uh, translate immediately into uh, more successful results in tests. And I'm just going to conclude my passage watching, watching the time and not exceeding my, um, my 15 minutes by talking about um, from this book uh, here, presented by the incomparable uh, James Arthur, um, who brought us all together. Um, and I, the chapter which I wrote in that book, um, uh, had, the, my title is called 10 Lessons for Character Education Drawn from Life. And um, so in this chapter, I was not seeking to, um, to, to, to offer a scholarly contribution to the debate, uh, but to draw on my own experience of um, 30 <laughs> years in schools, uh, 20 years, 20 of which, my last 20, which was running two different schools, Brighton College and Wellington College, in the last five years when I spent running a university. Uh, and the lessons are, uh, and very quickly, uh, criticise the, the action, not the perpetrator. Um, and there are so many examples where young people can be severely damaged um, when they feel themselves marginalised and scorned um, uh, by authority figures, um, whereas if their actions were condemned or their bad actions were condemned, um, and indeed the, the, the good actions praised, there would be a much more nuanced understanding and much higher self-esteem. Um, uh, moderation uh, is the second lesson and, and the importance of imparting moderation. When I started teaching, I, I was struck, and did I was struck all the way through, but by the desire of um, uh, teenagers to get wasted, um, uh, to be out of their minds. Uh, interesting phrase that, isn't it, out of your mind? Uh, and um, whose mind do you get into if you're out of your mind? Uh, or is it just a total um, negation of one's own individuality and responsibility? But, but that to, to impart a sense of, of um, moderation uh, in all things uh, is a virtue which I think is lost. Um, thirdly, helping students from a very early age um, reflect on what they want to do in life. So many young people in my experience at schools uh, would try to be mini-me's of their parents. And indeed that was the case with me. I chose economics rather than history when I went to university or economics as part of a degree involving philosophy and politics because my father was an economist. I'd be much better off if I'd studied history or English. I'd have enjoyed them much more importantly. I'd have understood what they were on about, perhaps. Um, but uh, helping young people think, what do they want? So all my way through as a teacher and as a head, and now running university students will say, what should I do? Um, uh, should I go there? Should I do this? What should I choose this subject or that? Uh, next year, should I go to university or this university? And I always, I learned to throw it back and say, well, what, what do you want? Um, and I say to parents regularly, 
back off from your children. It's not interesting what, what you want or what you think. Good parenting is about helping your child reach their own conclusions about what they want for their own lives. Lesson four is, is never crush uh, somebody who's come up with ideas. There's an awful lot of crushing that goes on in education. Um, and indeed, the, the, the factory model of exams and tests can just become a national crushing system where the individuality and flair and spontaneity, originality of each human being is squashed on the um, printing press of, of a typecast notion about what a good student is. Uh, fifthly what was break down walls. So, so now in, in this new book, um, The Fourth Education Revolution Reconsidered, uh, that's all about breaking down the walls of schools and universities. But even back in the 80s when I started, I'd always wanted to bring in outsiders and to get students um, outside talking, interviewing uh, 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 people in their local town or village, uh, uh, interviewing their, their grandparents, um, and reaching out so that the notion was implanted that education is a lifelong process, not just an institutional one. Uh, six is providing opportunities for older students to mentor the young. Um, and indeed, uh, the less successful students to mentor. Uh, and very quickly, I've realized that even the naughtiest, worst, student in any class, any year group, any house, any school, um, uh, would, they, they would get worse and worse the more that people say, oh yes, I've got you in my class, have I? Um, and, and that every time that gets them down a notch on their self-esteem uh, and, and is a wonderful, we talk about prison being a good uh, education for uh, further criminality, but but so often are schools by the diminish, d diminishing and disparagement of individuality. So um, I've found that that even that worst child, if you trusted them and said to them, "Look, um, I'd really like you to to spend half an hour a week uh, reading to um, or helping or talking to uh, X Y Z." Um, they'd always rise to it. And if you trusted people, um, they rise to the challenge. Schools are also in, so the institutions that patronize and diminish what people can achieve. Um, endlessly, I went to speech days where uh, the teachers were just rabbit, you, boringly, yawningly onwards. If the students themselves, even in junior schools, uh, were to get up and you, and you were to teach them to say the things. I mean, my goodness, you release so much spontaneity. Um, lesson seven is the, the value of roundedness. It, there's a positive discouragement for schools to want to have the arts and sport and character education and volunteering and the rest when these things are not rewarded or recognized um, in what makes a good school. Remember what we said about a good school being um, uh, that lazy, lazy, lazy uh, phrase, this is a good school, a good teacher, a good student, meaning merely that, they, that their exam performance is good, uh, almost invariably, because bright uh, young people enter at the bottom of it, uh, rather than the, the virtues, the added value of the teachers in it. So, um, um, the, the, the lesson eight is that we all have to um, reflect on our own experience, as I was doing with you at the beginning of this uh, brief chat, uh, about thinking about you know, what is the goodness in me? Is it innate? Where has it come from? How can I nurture it in others? How can I nurture it in myself? And um, lesson nine um, is that... Uh, we're all on a journey in life and we will, um, adversity is what we need to help us to reach a new level. And a life that is going swimmingly might um, seem to be attractive, uh, but it, it will not last. That character is always forged in the heat 
uh, of adversity and the way that we respond to it. And the importance in that of being calm, contemplative, reflective. Uh, one of the things I do, as you heard, is to write books about prime ministers, every one of them, without exception. Uh, every political leader of all countries that I've met uh, all um, uh, wish that they had more time for reflection. And after they retire, they wish that they had been more reflective about what they really wanted to do. And it's too late then. Uh, it's simply too late. Um, so the importance of using adversity positively and being reflective. Um, and then the final lesson was that we can have great character education in schools, but we need to link it up with colleges, further education, higher education, so that um, there's a sense there that they too are about building um, capacity in young people, not just to be good at cognitive skills with the ability to sit down and regurgitate uh, your subject or subjects in an exam that bears almost no relationship to anything that they're going to be doing again ever in their lives. But nevertheless, we uh, say that is um, an extraordinarily important way, or indeed the only way to assess the, the, the worth of a student and whether they get a first or a two one or, or whatever other degree. Um, but, but we need to universities, um, colleges, they need also to have a recognition that we're preparing young people for life and life in society, which at the moment is becoming increasingly harsh with COVID and with global warming and um, uh, hurricanes and, and fires and disease and problems over water and um, despotic leaders uh, driving wedges with their shallow binary visions of the world and into divisions between China and America. I mean, it's not a great printout, is it, when we look at the third decade of the 21st century. Uh, and we need to develop young people who've got the character to not only uh, live and flourish in that environment, but also to be beacons of, of hope and, and sanity. Uh, um, we need to have people who build good societies. I mean, going all the way back and to conclude, we've really learned nothing very much since the ancient philosophers told us that uh, a, a good education has character at the heart. Um, a good education is character education or it's nothing, but also the aim uh, of our work in education is to build that good society. There I think I'll end. I think I've gone up to about 17 minutes um, and apologies for that. No, not at all, um, Sanchez. That's a really interesting. Um, it's a wonderful synopsis. I've read the book and your 10 um, lessons. I, I recommend everyone to look into that even more detailed. But just one question uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, and it's a very difficult question, uh, Santony. Oh, I love the book questions. <laughs> out of all those um, 10 lessons, um, which one of those would you uh, put at the top uh, of the list, um, if it's possible. They're all very important. Which one would you prioritize uh, at the top, in your view? Um, well, um, I think that uh, the essence of good teaching is to engage others in a dialogue rather than to set oneself up as the font of all knowledge. So I would say, what do you think is the most important as you have read it? Um, I, I think, um, uh, it, I mean, being honest with you, I really appreciated uh, um, all of them. Uh, um, but um, um, the role model um, one was, um, very good because I think in society more role models there are that's uh, exemplify um, exemplification of more people who are doing good and what you're preaching. Um, yes, yeah, so my personal view. Okay, so, so let me just say there very quickly that uh, parents and teachers and politicians, um, any kind of 
person in a leadership or authority role makes a really fundamental mistake, I've made it all my life, of thinking that people are interested and listen to what I say rather than what I do or what I am. Um, and that we need to be able, as Gandhi said, to be the change, to embody um, authentically and wholeheartedly what it is we're talking about. So uh, there is no point, um, or put it this way positively, it's more important in a school to have a head or principal and, and teachers or in a university, presidents, vice chancellors, deans um, and all staff embodying the values than having them plastered all over the wall and people singing them. Um, so the importance of modeling uh, is very Im important. Uh, and that's why, again, I started with that exercise that I gave you, which is to not to look to me to come up with any answers, but to think yourselves and who you all are listening to and looking at this. Who are you? And what is the impact that you are giving? And um, I don't know, James Arthur would know, I don't know the extent to which one will be able to find it out, but intuitively it would make sense to me to say that those schools, colleges that are the most effective for character have character virtues embodied, lived by um, the staff in those institutions and particularly the leader. And one of the diseases of the factory model uh, is that the principal, the head, is often not seen or too often not seen by the students because they're so busy in their rooms, offices, crunching away at data, that they don't recognise the importance of being on the front door, welcoming every child, doing what you were saying at the beginning, which is to look at every child in their eye when they come in in the morning and being a physical presence, a, a, a still um, affirming, <clears throat> accepting physical uh, 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 and emotional presence for not just the students, but the staff also. So role modeling, yep, uh, you've convinced me. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Anthony. I really appreciate uh, um, your presentation and very uh, interesting speech. And thank you for being here. I know you're extremely busy and all the best in the future. I know you, you'll be um, uh, leaving your post as Vice Chancellor of Buckingham Un um, University. And thank you for all your help you've given um, all of us uh, um, uh, throughout uh, your role. Thank well, you. Well, I'm devoted to your cause and it's been an absolute honour to speak today. Uh, thank you for asking me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, bye for now. Um, let me now introduce you to Professor James Arthur OBE. Uh, Professor James Arthur is Director of Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues at the University of Birmingham. He was editor of the British Journal of Educational Studies for 10 years and holds numerous honorary titles in academia including Honorary Professor at the University of Glasgow, an Honorary Research Fellow at the University of Oxford. Professor James was made an Officer of the British Empire by the Queen in 2018. Professor James will now speak on character and virtues. Thank you, Samia, for that generous introduction. And I'd like to begin by saying that we uh, as a centre, a uh, uh, neo-Aristotelian centre, we um, follow some of the ideas of Aristotle, not all of them, but um, quite a few of them. Uh, now, Aristotle is a bit like uh, Sir Anthony in, in a sense, because uh, uh, Aristotle would be um, surprised that we've turned our schools into factories, factories that um, are really just concerned with examination results. And as they are just concerned with examination results, it means they only provide a partial education. 
the education you have in schools these days, especially in uh, the UK, is incomplete. Because what we're doing is we're neglecting the whole person often. We simply focus on what children know and what information they've been able to digest uh, and then be able to um, share in examination papers. This is not a full education. Now, most parents um, would be interested in their children being happy in school. They'd want their children to flourish. Um, and that's what education is about. It's about helping children and students in universities, um, you know, and, and, and every other educational context to flourish. And to flourish, you have to be able to um, develop your potential. Um, and that means those excellencies that every human being has within them. And this is why when Aristotle speaks of education and character and virtue, he's speaking in a sort of universal way. He's speaking of the human condition, about human beings. And he's speaking about them in terms of their potential, about what lies inside us and how we can be awakened and how we can become who we are through the process of education. And that takes time and it takes patience, but it also means that we have to think about education in a different way. Education is not simply about information. It's not simply about imparting information to the next generation. Education is actually about transformation. We have to become transformed by the experience of education. And education is delivered by teachers who are very important in our lives. Our parents are the first educators. Teachers, in some way, are our second educators. But we have many educators in life, from television, from culture, from people we meet in the shop, Education is part of culture uh, and culture educates us as well. And so we should think about education much more broadly than simply studying maths and arithmetic. What is the point of maths and arithmetic if they don't make people human? So the whole purpose of education is to make us more human and to bring out those potentials. We also want education to help us to live well in society. And we want education to help us to live in a world worth living in, which means that society itself helps educate us to become the people we are and, and have the potential to become, but we also have the potential to shape society. And Aristotle would have talked about both these things in his book on ethics and, of course, the other book, Politics. You have to read both to understand that. So we at the Jubilee Center have been promoting these ideas of character and virtue based on those goals of education, based on uh, what we think uh, are the goals of education. Now, the virtues can be divided into intellectual and intellectual virtues are about critical thinking and about autonomy, about helping young people to think. And it's about what Sir Anthony said, reflection. We live in an age where people don't think too much. We also live in an age where some people don't even recognize the ethical decisions that they have to make. They don't recognize the ethical dimension. And that's because we're rushing around uh, and we don't have time to reflect. So Aristotle would ask us to reflect, to be rational and to think before we act. We also need the moral virtues. These are some of the things, again, Anthony talked about in terms of justice in terms of honesty and truthfulness. And these are all to do with the moral virtues which we need. Not only do societies need a moral compass, individuals need a moral compass. They have to make wise decisions. And you make wise decisions as you progress towards this stage of what we call phronesis, the Greek word meaning flourishing, practical wisdom, uh, good sense, making wise decisions. We want children and students in universities to make a significant contribution to the common good of society, to their fellow human beings, to the world effectively, and to do so in a way which is unselfish, in a way which uh, offers humility in the way that they go about it. And we want these things because these virtues actually make people happy. People who are grateful from the research we have done are actually happier than people who are ungrateful. So it seems strange that when people are actually humble, 
And humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's simply thinking more of others. And so sometimes we, 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 we think of humility as being uh, a useless virtue, that what's the point of being humble? It doesn't help me. Well, that's the whole point. It does help you. It makes you happier, uh, uh, in a sense. We also want the civic virtues. That is civility, uh, good manners, being able to listen to people and what they say, respecting others, and, and participating in a democracy and participating in society generally. That's hugely important. We do need these performance virtues, which we also talk about. Performance virtues are sometimes called resilience. But unfortunately, lots of people concentrate simply on the performance virtues. But the performance virtues are really the muscles which allow the intellectual and the moral and the civic virtues thrive. Because if you think about it, People who are motivated, who are resourceful, who have resilience, uh, 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 etc. Th this could be a description of someone who's a member of the mafia. It could be used in criminal gangs. So I think the world is full of these performance virtues, as we would call them. Um, what we need, we need more of the moral uh, and intellectual virtues um, for society. And this is how society, I would say, uh, would flourish. But I know somebody wants to ask me some questions, so I'm going to stop that. Um, uh, thank, thank you um, uh, very much, uh, Professor James. Uh, um, I've just got one question after reading your excellent um, um, section of your book. Um, you mentioned character in the military, in the soldiers. Um, can you expand a little bit on the difference in character in different professions? such as health, law, business, and politics. Is there one theme they all should possess? Well, yes, and St. Anthony um, said it, they have to possess integrity. And all of these professions talk about integrity. Uh, they talk about um, uh, the ability to be honest, the ability to be trustworthy. And you, you would want um, someone to join your profession who would possess these virtues because it's not it's not good enough simply to have a whole lot of rules that professionals follow. Uh, they're a bit like children who go onto the internet. They always find a way around the rules. They find a way to access what they want to see on the internet, despite all the rules that we put in place. So what's important is the content of which these children, what, what the content these children are looking at. That's far more important and, and the ability for them to make wise decisions. The same with professionals, the rules, have not helped. This is why we've had a crisis in banking, but we've had a crisis in, in many professions, in the law, police officers doing the wrong thing, um, lawyers doing the wrong thing, even teachers doing the wrong thing as well. So you, you can look at medicine and the same, same thing arises. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that the ethics that teachers and doctors and lawyers are taught are real and authentic and not something that's just uh, presented to them um, in a way which says, as long as you don't get caught, you know, these are the types of things which you have to be, be thinking about, but you know, don't get caught if you do, do terrible things. Um, and I think people are um, much more aware today about the ethical dimensions of the professions in which they're in. The differences between them are not, not strong. I'm saying most professionals have the same types of virtues which are needed. Uh, all the professions need uh, very similar virtues in order to thrive, in order, and also for the public to recognize these professionals as almost above reproach, that you know, your teacher is someone that you would trust, that the children would trust them, that society trusts, and the same for your doctor. This is what people want. They want to be able to trust these professionals, and that's why uh, they're held to a higher account than most other people would be. Wonderful, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor James. Uh, it's interesting you talk about integrity. Uh, Lord uh, Nolan in 1996 proposed the seven principles of public life and integrity, um, including selflessness, uh, accountability, honesty, openness, objectivity, um, and um, also leadership uh, is involved. And I think the book encompasses all of that. Thank you very much. I would like to now introduce you to Timothy Metcalf, uh, who will portray the potential and role of artificial intelligence in education. 
uh, Timothy Metcalf is a partnerships lead uh, for AI in education, involving in harnessing AI and immersive technologies to enable new ways of uh, teaching, learning, of uh, assessments and um, machine learning. Timothy formerly acted in a wide range of organizations, including University College London, the University of Southampton, and the Science and Engineering South Consortium. Um, following your presentation, Graham Robertson, Commonwealth Futures International Ambassador, will preside over the question and answer session. Uh, Mr. Timothy Metcalf. Thank you. Thanks very much, Samar. Thank you for inviting me. Um, can we have the uh, first slide of my presentation? I'll be going through a whistle-stop tour of um, artificial intelligence, what um, it can do within education and its impact on, on going um, through the next decade. Uh, so next slide, please. As we have discussed earlier within the, the webinar is that the current educational model is very much a, a factory model. It was designed um, with the um, Industrial Revolution, you know, the Victorian age where people were expected or needed to become more like machines. They needed to increase their, their production output. And it was literally for teachers to help um, um, teach other people to become more like machines. What we need now is for AI to help teach students to become more human. And then we were chatting about it earlier to develop those characterful traits rather than just uh, perform well in the, uh, the exam arena. Now, AI, what that does, that offers the potential for a more personalized learning experience that, that actually adapts to each individual learner, whether they're at school, college, university, or if they're at work, um, it doesn't really matter is that AI can become this personal teacher that will help um, recommend new uh, areas to look into that will help you, you know, progress within your career or whatever else you, you want to do. Um, AI relies a lot on data and it captures data on, you know, you all the time when you go shopping, it'll get data on your shopping habits, your gaming habits, your um, uh, entertainment habits, transport habits, all that sort of thing. AI can access that data and get a, a good idea about, you know, what your preferences are, what your needs are. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so AI in education. Um, now, when I talk about AI, um, artificial intelligence. What I'm, I am talking more broad spectrum. So it's not necessarily just the artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, because it is how how are they embodied in in, in different um, systems and technologies. Um, so adaptive learning platforms. Um, there's been an explosion this year in in releasing these and, and adopting these these platforms. They're digital platforms whereby. The, the learner can go on and fill in some, some basic questions. And then the, the learning platform gets an understanding of where the strengths are, the weaknesses are, and then will suggest little components to, to learn. And these tend to be 10, 20 minute um, components, which will then strengthen those weak areas um, and adapt to the person's, as I said, their, their preferences and their, their needs. Um, how else is AI used? Well, in technologies like we're using at the moment, communication. AI can, can really help um, bridge the, the distance divide. Uh, image recognition is, is another one that gets used and will be much more used within, within universities. You know, so when, for example, if someone walks into a classroom, they don't have to, uh, the teacher won't have to take register because as the child walks in, uh, the AI can, can pick up who it is and where they are within each classroom. Immersive reality, that's a catch-all phrase for virtual reality, augmented reality, and um, uh, enhanced reality. So that, these are different um, virtual realities, which I suppose, you know, you see the headsets, which 
we've 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 got on on sale and which get used a lot in training um and they can really place you in an environment which um you know you might not be able to get into otherwise for example you might be able to explore ancient rome ancient greece or if you're training to be a bomb disposal expert you can go into diffuse a bomb and you will hear all of the sounds and see everything that you would normally see, but in an environment which is non-lethal. So those, those technologies are quite handy and they're not just in the gaming environment. Robotics and chatbots. Um, chatbots are certainly on the, the increase where uh, you can talk to at your smart speaker um, and it'll talk back to you, for example, but you can, you can also say, what is the capital of Belgium? Or, or can you find me some, some new uh, news articles on the bleaching of the coral reefs? Uh, so you can, you can talk to um, your computer um, and with robotics, that is basically a robot, but that is more of a physical human nature. Um, you know, you can actually ask a robot, robotic, um, to do some manual labor for you to, to carry goods around for you so that's you know if you're in a teaching um, environment as a teaching support assistant can actually go around and uh, just in, just find out to see all the children are behaving for example if they're making a noise so the impact of a lot of those technologies as i said it helps with conversational learning that's that's something that is new where you are talking to um, basically an AI machine which can access vast amounts of data within an education environment, could access research papers, it can access the internet. You can limit what it accesses so that it doesn't bring back um, nefarious links that might uh, be uh, things that you don't want to be looking at. Uh, Game-based learning. Uh, there are some software providers, there's some really popular games that have removed the aggressive element and where you can walk around ancient Rome and ancient Greece um, in very highly detailed environments. And they've added an educational um, situation to that where you can go and inquire about pottery and, and things like that. Collaborative learning. Again, there's, there's a lot of uh, cloud-based tools which enable you to communicate and share files create spaces where you can collaborate with others right across the world. It just doesn't matter where you are anymore. Um, and AI can help make sense of that. For example, this uh, webinar is being recorded. Um, what you can do is you can have the, the words come up at the bottom of the screen so that you can watch it um, without actually having to listen to it. So for the people who are hearing impaired, they are now you know, beneficiaries of that. And what you can also do is you can say, well, I don't want to watch or listen to this webinar in English. I want to listen to it in my home language. Please, can you translate? And it'll do an immediate real-time translation so that the subtitles come up in the language of your preference. So language barriers start to disappear. Although, you know, there's still some, some ways to go to, uh, for AI to be able to um, interpret everybody's accents and, and mumblings so that they get that clear and they also they miss a lot of the nuances between translating of languages and, and finally uh, well in the last two continuous assessment something that has been mentioned previously uh, is that AI can continually monitor how you are progressing where you need um, to improve and how well you're doing um, so that it actually builds a very very good picture uh, that's actually very, very useful when we look at uh, what's happened in the UK with cancellation of exams and then the final marks are left to teachers' estimates, uh, which is highly variable and, and there's a lot of issues with that. If we had something like continuous assessment, it could look back over the years and say, well, you have averaged X percent and therefore my projected grade for you based on historical data of X number of years is going to be this. And you could have a, you know, a standard um, assessment that would be exactly the same for everyone. So that's one of the things that you know, we, we, can, we can see. Uh, and finally, optimizing the learning space. You know, you'll have sensors, you can have sensors within a classroom that can measure temperature, um, where people are gathering. So you can find hot spots. you can make sure that there's the, the air conditioning is or that the air there's good airflow 
um, it was max, you know, optimizing your space so that rather than actually the, the uh, task of educating, but for creating a, uh, an environment which is conducive to, to learning and remembering what you're learning. So for final slide, I, I might have rattled on a little bit too much there, but uh, um, potential gains, you know, from AI, you know, the social mobility aspect. If you can access the same educational materials as a student from Eton or any other private schools or anywhere in the world, if you can access the same materials from something like an, an adaptive learning platform and progress at the same level as those, your aspirations go up because you don't see yourself as inferior because you're not. Just because you might be geographically remote or come from a deprived background, it does not matter. You can, certain, you can access the same material. So it's a strong driver there. Uh, stage, not age. What I'm referring to there is that you can learn uh, and the, 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 the AI will, will present learning materials to you based on how, how well you are learning, not what age you are. Everybody progresses at different speeds. And so you should not expect everybody to go through the factory model at the same speed some will be further ahead than others. Now, with a lot of the um, enablers from, from AI and that it actually gives you a lot of material to teach and it provides a lot of continuous assessment and feedback, that actually reduces a lot of the administrative burden on teachers. Now, they're overworked to start off with, but any free time that a teacher might have, and I'm not saying that they will necessarily always have free time, but they will have more time to teach. And that is what they went into the game for is to teach and inspire and motivate and, and work with, with, with students. Uh, and that is where their real value lies. The value of AI does not lie within those spheres. It relies in presenting um, information and accessing information. But the inspiration element, the character element, you need that personal interaction for. Um, because you can access so much um, information and you're not limited to whatever is in a school book, you can develop a broader breadth of knowledge, uh, which, is, which is good when you want to find out what you want to do with your life. If you've got um, the ability to find out all of the different uh, careers that you might be able to go into. Um, that individualization, not homogenization, what that means is you can follow your own learning path to a, to a an extent. You still need to reach an end goal, which would say, yes, you have fulfilled all of the success criteria, let's call it that, rather than you've passed these, these specific high stakes one-off exams. Actually, you know, we know that you are capable of doing a, a range of things. It's much more stimulating for students, in fact, because they do have a much more uh, ownership over their learning. It's also much more stimulating for teachers. Uh, because they are involved in the personal characteristics and the development of their students rather than marking 30 papers in an evening, which is, can be quite, quite challenging, especially you have to do that year in, year out. Continuity of learning. If you have this personal AI assistant when you go from primary school to high school to university, it can follow you. Or if you get um, you, one particular year, you get a teacher that you don't get on with. It does not matter because you have that, that other support mechanism which provides the continuity. And it can carry on throughout life uh, within a continuous professional development. It is there. It could even grow old with you. Um, uh, better preparation for the world of work. work. You know, no one in work actually needs to take exams. Uh, you don't have those high pressure situations. What you do have is the need to work with others, communicate with others, uh, motivate and inspire others. So doing that at school and university better prepares you for the work environment. And finally, as I said, it, it really does encourage you and put you in that mindset for long term, you know, continuous professional lifelong learning, which, which is going to be essential going forward. So that is my whistle top stop tour. And it'll be much easier to go through sort of questions and answers to bring some of these to life. So there again, that's where that's where I am. Timothy, thank you so much um, for, for that today. I really do appreciate it. Um, I have a whole list of questions for you, but unfortunately, we are very short of time today. 
So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and ask you one question. Uh, one of our missions is to reach the Commonwealth and uh, uh, reach out to some of the more remote areas as well. And uh, we look to look uh, to I care for reading and I care for education. I wonder if I could invite you back another time to expand on on what you've been telling us today and teach us maybe more about how uh, AI could help in that area, in that area of eye care and education from, from your knowledge of, of the, the science and your knowledge of education and how we might uh, use AI to reach out to uh, uh, throughout the Commonwealth. I think that would be great and I would welcome you back another day. Uh, sorry we don't have time for specific uh, uh, questions uh, today, but if if, uh, if you would be happy to do that, we'd be very happy to have you for another another session. Most most certainly, yes. There's there's lots of applications for for that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, happy to do it, Graham. Thank you so much. Uh, just very briefly before we wind up, thank you uh, uh, to all our speakers today. Uh, thank you, Sir Anthony, uh, and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, all the all the speakers. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, presentation is, I believe, on the 20th of October. Uh, we have uh, Lord Botang, um, and uh, it's, we're going to be having one of our country-specific uh, 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 presentations. I think we're focusing on, on Ghana on the 20th. Um, so please all join us. We do so appreciate you all coming on to these uh, online sessions. So thank you again for everyone who's attended. Uh, Thank you to our speakers and uh, really appreciate it. And join us next time on the, on the 20th of October. Uh, Michael, if you can put the email there. Thank you so much. We'll leave that on for 30 seconds uh, so you can jot down. Um, we also ask that you tell your friends. Uh, we're looking for support throughout Commonwealth Futures for both speakers that can bring us uh, the interesting topic that we've had today. Uh, and we're also looking for people who can help with uh, Commonwealth connections so that we can uh, take that message further. So thank you all. I apologize we've run slightly over today, uh, but I think you'll all agree it's been a wonderful session. So thank you all again, and we'll see you next time. Appreciate it. Thank you.